motion to approve the uh, meeting minutes held on June 18, 2019. So moved. Second? Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 At this point, can we have uh, one Scarsdale Road come up and present? I'm assuming everyone's here for that uh, project this evening. Good evening, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, members of the public. My name is Seth Mandelbaum. I'm a partner with the law firm of McCullough, Goldberger, and Stout, and I'm pleased to be here this evening representing uh, the Riverview Condominium regarding their application for amended site plan approval to demolish the uh, smokestack located at One Scarsdale Road. Uh, as you all know, the property is developed with the Riverview Condominiums and is located at the intersection of Scarsdale Road and Lake Avenue, adjacent to the fountains at River, Riverview Retirement Community and the Old Stone Mill Restaurant, among other things. Uh, with me this evening, I have Erica Diamond of Benchmark Property Management, who have been the managing agent for the condominium for about two years. I have uh, Adamo Mariano, the project architect. Uh, Michael Walsh, professional engineer with PCS Engineering, a structural engineering firm. and. Uh, I'll present Michael uh, in a moment to summarize uh, his conclusions. Uh, and also here this evening are uh, many condo unit owners from the Riverview condominiums. Uh, my understanding is uh, many of the people, if I know it's not all the people, but many people on this side of the room uh, are condo unit owners. And my understanding is not only have they submitted letters supporting the application, a few of them are ready to speak tonight. Um, and I don't normally do this, but because there's so many people and so we don't sit here all night, with your indulgence, I'd just like, by a show of hands, who are condo unit owners here and who support the application to demolish the smokestack? Just to give the board a sense of how important an issue this is to the people that own those condominium units. Um, uh, just for the record, we received all your uh, um, letters and uh, documentation. Thank you. And let me just start by saying, as we talked about at the work session, uh, both in June and a couple of weeks ago. We're not here to try to make excuses for the prior two or three managing agents that you heard about at the work session or the prior boards. Uh, we know the original approval had a condition about maintaining the smokestack and sp filing inspection reports every year. We don't deny that the last inspection report was filed in the fall of 2013. when. Ms. Diamond's uh, firm took over as managing agent. They really uh, worked very hard to try to clean up a lot of issues, including issues with the roof, other issues in the building, and of course this was a primary issue that, that they tried to get control of, and that is why uh, we're here this evening uh, as we're working through that process. What we would ask the board to do, and again, we're not denying that there was a gap in those inspection reports is to look at the conditions today, balance that evidence against your site plan criteria, and make an informed decision. And I think you'll hear arguments for or against tonight. You'll hear people that are very impassioned, I'm sure, about the history of the village and where this site overall fits into that history, where there were many smokestacks uh, based on the industrial past. Uh, and we get that. But we have to look at an unsafe structure, what it would take if it's even feasible, and you'll hear from Mr. Walsh about some of the issues with this structure. Uh, financially, it'll be a huge burden on, on the community of the condo unit owners. Uh, and I did submit a couple of articles about lightning strikes that have damaged uh, other similar smokestacks in the Northeast that are near uh, residential communities like this one, uh, as well as the other information you've received uh, before I was involved from Ms. Diamond regarding the costs uh, to either repair or demolish the smokestack. Uh, if I may, I, I would like to submit one document that um, we didn't have for the work session. It's an addendum to the report from NYC Restoration Group, who had originally prepared an estimate uh, to repair the smokestack before the structural inspection was done of about $264,000. Uh, based on their experience, in light of Mr. Walsh's report, that estimate is now between 562000 and 680000 
because of all the structural issues. So I'd like to hand this in uh, to, to the clerk and the board, if I may. Yeah, sure. Thank you so much. Seth, would, would it be possible to um, obtain a detailed report, a uh, detailed estimate, rather than just a lump sum number? In other words, trying to figure out, you know, what constitutes $561,733, how much right, there, there, you know, So just to get a better understanding of what the costs associated with this uh, I number. understood. There, there were detailed estimates filed originally, okay. um, both for uh, the repair of the smokestack as well as demolition. This, this is an addendum to that repair, that detailed repair, but okay. if you need some more information, I think we can, we can look into that. Excuse me. Mike, do we have those uh, estimates? They were filed back in May and June. Okay. okay. Can we get a copy of those as well? Thank you. How many estimates were there? Two? Yes. There was one estimate for the repair and one estimate for the demolition, which was about 147000 as, of course, a one-time cost. In fact, the condo was already given a $36,000 deposit on that 147 uh, before they were informed, you know, they, they filed an application, they were informed they had to come to, to the planning board for site plan. But um, with that, uh, I think I'd like to bring up um, our structural engineer. I think sure. that would be a, a, to summarize his uh, signed and sealed report that he filed, that I filed on, on behalf of the uh, condo. And then, of course, our whole team is happy to answer any questions. So with that, I'd like to bring up Michael Walsh to just tell you a little bit about uh, his qualifications uh, his, and his conclusions after inspecting the smokestack. Michael. Uh, good evening, and thank you. My name is Michael Walsh, um, engineer of PCS Engineering, uh, located in Valhalla, but we predominantly do our work down in Manhattan. Uh, I've been an engineer, I hate to say, for 40 years. I've uh, been a PE for 36, uh, concentrating on structural uh, master's degree from Columbia in structural engineering. Uh, spent my life doing a lot of forensics. The past, past 15 years, though, it has been concentrated on uh, Manhattan buildings, older buildings, a lot of brick structures, brick steel uh, with steel skeletons. <coughs> in what role? Excuse me? In what role? In other words, were you doing special inspections? Were you doing design? Just get a sense of what your uh, scope of work uh, would be. Work with building owners assessing the conditions and detailing what repairs need to be done to bring them up to a safe condition. So do you perform special inspections? Special inspections, yes. Okay. Yeah, I do structural special inspections. Okay. Um, so very familiar with uh, older brick structures. Uh, brick is a uh, porous material. It's, it's, it's designed to absorb moisture and release it. Uh, what happens? During uh, the fall and uh, spring months, on the edges of the winter, you get freeze-thaw cycles. It beats up the mortar, and uh, uh, the mortar becomes granulated and dead. So periodically, you got to grind out the dead mortar in the outer portions and repoint. Uh, what happens over time, even with the best maintenance, uh, the inner uh, mortar becomes dead, becomes granulated. Then you lose your structural adhesion, and your structural integrity goes south very quick. Uh, prime example, uh, uh, apartment buildings. Uh, you'll see them repointing, but the parapets get replaced on a much more frequent schedule. That's because they get weather from both sides. This smoke that once it start, stopped being used, is losing that heat from the inside to help repel that moisture. It does elongate the service life. It doesn't extend it infinitely. Ultimately, all most masonry structures need to be taken down and rebuilt. Um, the condition of this one is extremely poor. As you can see, the very deep um, mortar loss and the inner, granule, inner uh, mortar layers are granulated. So it's really becoming, slowly becoming a uh, pile of bricks with no adhesion. Uh, it's really kind of a liability. The accessibility to the top of the structure is definitely throughout probably its history. I'm sure maintenance you know, couldn't be done on a routine basis that you would like. And that would, you know, add to the deterioration over its whole life. Uh, but in its present condition, it is, you know, very poor. We deal with a lot of older building structures and facades down in the city, 1840s, 1830s, 
You know, I looked at three buildings today, uh, different conditions. And when you get into these older structures, you find that you start taking off the face brick and the inside just falls out and there's nothing to do but to demolish that facade and rebuild it if, if you want. That kind of summarizes it very quick. Uh, I don't want to take too much of your time. So can, can you explain uh, how you did your analysis? Visual. I, I just went there and looked and you could stick your finger in a spick in, uh, uh, st or a stick in the mortar joints and the mortar just comes out, uh, you know, farther you can reach. Also looking at the report from the, on the higher elevations, they also did inspections on the inside and there's evidence of the very significant deterioration pretty much all over. Okay, so basically you just went to the site and you looked at the chimney and you, I mean, it's evident that the, uh, the joints are uh, missing mortar. Correct. Okay, so it's just a visual uh, um, inspection. Correct. Was any inspection done on the brick itself? Again? Was any inspections done on the brick itself? In other words, have we, did you take a piece of brick out and send no, it to a lab to have a compressible this test done? This was a strictual, strictly a visual inspection done this past okay. July. All right. And you only did the exterior, you didn't go inside? So I, I have poor hearing. Oh, yeah, maybe the mic is not on you know, too well here. You're having an issue as well. It's low. Hey, hey Wade? Can you raise the mic a little bit? I think people are, can't hear me. The brick, you know, the brick is in beat up condition. It's some, some of them could be reusable. We do that in buildings sometimes, but some of it gets so deteriorated around the edges from the freeze thaw damage that. Uh, we, we visited the site and we looked at the, the chimney and we kind of witnessed exactly what you were discuss, uh, you know, uh, describing. You know, there is, uh, you know, mortal loss and there have been some attempts to actually repoint sections of the, uh, uh, the chimney. Um, I was just, again, wondering whether or not the actual brick itself has deteriorated to the point where, you know, it cannot support its load. So I was just wondering if anyone has done any sort of analysis on the actual take a break or two out from different sections and figure out, hey, does this have the compressible load required to actually support itself? Okay, so I was just kind of in the, okay. Um, the repointing is useful, you know, it's meaningless if you have nothing to adhere to inside. Well, no question, that's fine, you know, I, I get that. Uh, and uh, um, the chimney is capped, correct? Do you know? I don't know. According to the report, it's capped. The, re the 2013 report. Because okay. I actually just, received yeah. it this evening and we, I just did a quick look at it and uh, I just want to make sure we're on the same page. Yeah. Section 4.2.4? Yes. I'm going to read it out. Okay. You see it? Okay. I'll make sure. <laughs> All right. Would you like to add anything else? Yeah, cap, right, sir? Yeah. So uh, I just want to. Um, kind of reiterate, uh, uh, we did go out to the site, we did, again, uh, uh, view the things you discussed, but I was just cur curious to see if any sort of, uh, uh, did you use binoculars, a drone, or anything to go up high? Just binoculars and binoculars. photo lens is more reliable than a binoculars. Okay. All right. Okay. And your visual um, survey, majority of this structure is in this condition, you believe? Uh, well, uh, the mortar joints, a very a significant amount, are, are really bad, really deep. I'd say, you know, 40% are well past, um, uh, very deep. You know, the, the bricks could probably be pulled out at this point, the face brick. Yeah, from the lower level, we actually uh, were able to take one out because there was just no uh, uh, mortar around it, but we didn't really witness much of that. Uh, it would, looks like the... Uh, um, I guess would be the uh, uh, west side where you have that uh, 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 straight section. That straight section, that's kind of a poor disrepair, but I mean, realistically, it just it sounds like it needs a great deal of repointing. More than repointing because once that inner courses get dead, the mortar granulates, that the dead is the term they use. There's nothing to adhere to. The whole 
the whole report thing will come out as a whole. When you're I understand that, but I, I think it sounds like we were able to get to a specific height, 10 feet. Uh, I mean, how far did we get? Was there? Oh, it, mine was just visual from gray with the telephoto lens, and then uh, using the rep there was a lot of extensive right. photos in the report from 2013. Okay. I mean, I, I'm going to go and uh, read this report uh, thoroughly, and then I'll, I'll get back to it. Okay. Thank you. Anybody have any questions for this gentleman? Okay. No, All right. Thank you. Thank you. So unless there are any other specific questions about the site plan itself, uh, that's essentially our initial presentation, uh, in addition to, of course, all the written material we've already uh, submitted. Right. Um, so we're happy to answer any questions. Uh, yeah, I mean, just, I wanted to, just for the record, you know, the, uh, um, the development received the approval in 2009. As part of the approval, there was the, uh, the um, uh, condition that the, fire pl the uh, chimney be maintained, right? I just want to put that on record so we're all aware of the... Um, yeah, we don't deny that, but I believe okay. the approval was from 1998. I'm sorry, okay, 1998. Okay, sorry. just... Yes, we, we're, we concur that the original approval from 1998 did have that condition. Right, and do we have a sense of how much uh, maintenance was actually done on it and, and during what periods? Because I, I don't think we... Do we Mike, do we have any sort of... Uh, um, documentation that indicated an X, Y year and uh, some sort of uh, uh, repairs are made to the chimney. Okay. Just be interesting to see, you know, uh, how many times. I mean, there was work done to the, the chimney. You could see the repointing section of it. Yeah. But again, just curious, uh, just wondering how, how many efforts have been made. You know, is it annual? Is it every five years? Every whatever. Yeah, I, I believe the new managing agent did research that and was unable to find any records. Um, I recall the 2013 report, I believe, suggested some work had been done in, in some of the photographs. Uh, you can right. show some areas that look like they've been repointed, um, but we can research that a little further. Okay, please. On anything right. else. That's what we have. So okay. Um, anybody have any questions? All right. So at this point, uh, I'd like to open the public hearing. Okay. I make a motion to, I'm sorry. No, Mr. Chair, I just want to, um, at the work session, Member Forgione decided, um, realized that oh, there was a potential right. conflict with him, so he's going to recuse himself for this application. That is correct. He won't be voting on opening the public hearing. He's just right. going to sit out and listen. Sit out and listen and provide any comments. All right, so at this uh, point, I'd like to make a motion to open the public hearing. Can I have a second, please? So moved. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, so at this point, anyone who'd like to speak, please come up. If you haven't signed, the, uh, uh, the pad that was sent out earlier, please sign uh, when you get to the podium. Thank you. Uh, just identify yourself, where you live, and uh, um, that's it. Good evening, my name is Mark Arison, and I'm a, a condo owner at One Scarsdale Road, the Riverview. I, I submitted a, uh, a letter, and um, I am going to uh, just uh, summarize some of the things that I said in my letter so that be part of the public record. Um, and the point of my presentation tonight is that um, I did a little research because I was uh, concerned about the comments that I was hearing that this was a safety hazard. Um, and for people who drive by the smokestack every day, I do. People who walk by the smokestack, for people who live uh, in the area of facing the smokestack, uh, for people in the um, assisted living facility right next door, uh, if this was a public safety hazard, um, that would be of importance to me as a uh, resident of the town and a, a condo owner um, at Riverview. So it's amazing what you could find on the internet. And if you put into a Google search on the internet, smokestack safety, you come up with an enormous number of events that have happened over uh, many, many, many years regarding similar smokestacks. Now, these smokestacks, I learned, were in great popularity in manufacturing facilities starting in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s. And as a matter of fact, um, the smokestack which remains at the One Scarsdale property um, was one of um, many smokestacks that were in use at the property. I heard last night that there were as many as nine at one time. This is the one that remains. But if you do a, the Google search that I did and you put in um, accidents that happen, what comes up most frequently is that lightning 
strikes these smokestacks with great frequency. Um, and when lightning strikes these smokestacks, what happens is that the lightning goes in and the bricks explode out. And um, the most recent example of this I found was at a condominium development of all things, uh, very much like ours, in a town near Boston, Massachusetts called Haverhill. Um, lightning struck the smokestack and bricks started flying and every single person in the condominium was required to evacuate the condominium because the smokestack was situated quite like ours, uh, right next to the condominium building, and they had to take down the smokestack in an emergency uh, situation. What happened is that the bricks explode out and go flying. I mean, you could imagine the damage that a flying brick would have if it hit a car and dented uh, the hood of a car or the windshield of a car or the window of an apartment uh, building or the head of a person walking underneath or, or by. So um, that led me to do a little further research, and I was wondering whether anybody um, had ever been killed by an accident that happened um, at one of these smokestacks. And I couldn't believe it, but um, when this property was owned, this very property was owned by the Burroughs Welcome Company uh, during the 60s, um, one of the smokestacks um, exploded and a brick came flying out and actually killed a Tuckahoe resident um, named Francis Donahue. He was 57 years old, lived in Tuckahoe and had a family here, was an employee of the of Barrel's Welcome. And this man uh, on our property, one Scarsdale Road property, was killed by a flying, flying brick coming out of one of these smokestacks. So um, there are many examples of this, but it just was haunting to me and quite eerie that a Tuckahoe resident had already uh, been killed by a flying brick coming out of the smokestack. So while I appreciate the history of the smokestack and the history that's, re that's uh, referred to in the handout that we saw here, um, and I don't doubt that the smokestack reminds us of, of the research that led um, to uh, treatment for terrible diseases, it seems rather absurd to commemorate the research that led to the uh, treatment of terrible diseases by maintaining today a smokestack that could very well result in the death of people uh, nearby from flying bricks. So with that, I'll uh, yield my time to anybody else who'd like to... Uh... Oh, um, yes, so the Haverhill article uh, that I referred to was in the July uh, 1st Boston Globe. I have a copy of that printed out if anybody would like to review it. And the story about uh, Mr. Donahue um, was from a newspaper, which I never heard of, but maybe some of you have, called the Review Press and Reporter from Bronxville oh, um, on December 27th, 1962. And I have several copies of that article if anybody would like to. Sure, I'll, I'll take some. Would you happen to know if the one, the um, smokestack in Havistraw had lightning protection on it? I don't know, but I did research that also. Right. And, and I'm not an expert on this, believe me, but um, it turns out that lightning protection does not stop the bricks from flying, even if the lightning is absorbed by the lightning protection and there are loose bricks and the, and the, and the uh, structure shakes and the bricks go flying. So the lightning protection absorbs the lightning, grounds it, but there's an impact to the building on the left. I'll, I'll take one. You could give one to the uh, clerk. Thank you. Hi there. Hi. My name is Dick Forleano. I'm the Eastchester Town Historian. 
um, uh, talking for a number of groups today, um, each at the Historical Society, and Laney, who's with me, is going to be talking for the Tuckahoe History Committee. Um, I'm just going to really talk about the history of the smokestack so you can put it in its proper perspective. I realize this is a very important dilemma here that hopefully um, we can come to an understanding on. Uh, to us who appreciate the history of Tuckahoe, this is more than a smokestack. It's a landmark. Uh, and if we go back, and I, I'm not going to take too much time, uh, in, in three minutes I'm going to do two, two and a half centuries of history. Uh, Tuckahoe overcame two great revolutions. The American Revolution, when this entire town, which was two and a half times the size of what it is today, was decimated. And at the beginning of the 19th century, we faced another revolution, the Industrial Revolution. And on the banks of the Bronx River, um, <clears throat> we have preserved the Old Stone Mill, the second oldest cotton mill in America. It went bankrupt after seven years. And the next year, marble was discovered. By the time the smokestack was built, it was 1852. Um, and now, with the arrival of the train, uh, Tuckahoe marble could be exported. But Tuckahoe marble was not the major employer in town. It was Hodgman rubber, which um, made rubber goods for the general public, pioneers moving west, Civil War soldiers and sailors, as a Spanish-American, also in a Spanish-American war, and especially in World War I. Hodgman Rubber employed 1,700 people. The entire population of Tuckahoe was only 3,000. And then when the Spanish flu hit, which killed more people than any other war up to that time in American history, the Hodgman brothers were very civic-minded. They opened the fifth floor of a Hodgman Rubber as a hospital to the dead and dying. And then came uh, Burroughs Welcome in 1925. And its mission was to find cures for diseases that were ravaging uh, America and the world. And by the time Hodgman uh, Burroughs Welcome left, two chemists, Trudy Ilion and, um, <clears throat> and George Hitchings, had pioneered drugs that found cures for leukemia, malaria, and uh, the drug ACT, which is used for AIDS. Countless numbers of residents and former residents looked to that tower as a testimony to their immigrant parents and grandparents and great-grandparents who came to the wonderful village of Tuckahoe, which really has a place in my heart. And what I see in Tuckahoe, which makes it unique in America, is as a place that looks for consensus and, <clears throat> and solutions, whether it's ethnic and racial diversity, um, the preservation of landmarks, it's very important. And I, I appreciate the courtesy of everybody here. There's one thing that guides me is I've been a historian for 30, 31 years. And uh, one thing that guides me constantly, that a community that does not, that is not aware from whence it came goes blindly into the future. And I want to commend you, you, got, you people, uh, the planning board, for the time and consideration that they're putting into this very important issue. Now I'd like to introduce Laney Provenzal, who will talk for the Tuckahoe History Committee. Good evening. My name is Elaine Pagliaroli Provenzano. In the late 1990s, the village of Tuckahoe required that the purchaser of the Revlon site was to maintain the smokestack, which was stated previously tonight. That maintenance has been neglected and a request has been made by the owners to remove the structure. Speaking on behalf of the History Committee, 
I would like to address the historical value of the structure and its site. To ascertain the preservation status of the smokestack, I contacted Dan Baygrow and William Crattinger of New York State Historic Preservation. They gave me documentation confirming that inquiries had been made on May 26, 2015 about the historical status of the structure. In response to Andrew Maziarski of Telecom, Jennifer Betsworth, Historic Preservation Specialist, states, thank you for contacting our offices to inquire about the stone mill complex in Tuckahoe. The complex was determined eligible for the National Register of Historic Places on February 29, 1996, for its important historic role in local and regional commerce and as a significant collection of 19th and 20th century mill architecture. The survey district report and determination of eligibility describe the major buildings located within the complex. Although the smokestack located within the complex is not specifically mentioned in this documentation, it is clear that it is historically and functionally related to the stone mill complex. As such, it should be considered part of the eligible district. To clarify this matter, a new USN has been created for the smokestack, and it has been attached to the survey district in CRIS, our online records management system. Why is this site relevant and important to our local history? As Richard had stated, Daniel Hodgman purchased the old stone cotton mill, the second oldest cotton mill in the country, originally around the, in the surrounding lands in 1853 in the historic Lakeville area of Tuckahoe. Some of you may have noticed there's a sign going down Lake Avenue. That's a Lakeville sign. Hodgman developed the site around the mill, adding the main buildings and smokestacks, of which only the two main buildings, now Riverview, the administrative offices, Sterling Bank, former cafeteria, and one smokestack remain. During World War I, Hodgman Rubber Company provided 750,000 raincoats for the Army, as well as sterilizing bags for fresh water and gas mask fabric. According to Pillar of Yonkers, which we have a copy up here on the table, this business exerted considerable influence over the growth and success of Aquahung, which is another name for the Bronx River area, and surrounding area, particularly in the village of Tuckahoe. The old stone building had pioneered in cotton and rubber, but still was rugged and prepared further to serve humanity while making jobs for people in the area. The model continued when the English-based Pearls Welcome purchased the property in 1927 for its USA branch. Pillar of Yonkers states that far-reaching programs of pure and applied research were initiated, and an impressive background of scientific achievement was created. The records of these achievements include some that have become milestones in medical and pharmacological research, including the first anti-diphtheretic -dipth serum in the U.S., ergometrin, digoxin, global insulin, and later on Sudafed and Contact. You may have another standout in your own medicine cabinets today, Neosporin. As a child, my father would point with pride at the label on the back of the Burroughs Welcome product were stamped in bold letters, made in Tuckahoe, New York. During World War II, Burroughs Welcome and Company production facilities frequently worked around the clock to turn out many items for eventual use by the armed forces. My father's generation grew up without antibiotics. While serving in the Navy, he was one of the first to experience their testing within the armed forces and developed an appreciation of their life-saving value. When Burroughs relocated to Triangle Park, North Carolina in the late 60s, the baton was passed to U.S. Vitamin Corporation, which then became Revlon Healthcare. In the early 80s, I worked in the research library and for research doctors submitting data from field operations to the FDA for approval. These drugs ranged from uh, drugs to treat hypertension, like endapamide, to oxy face wash. The accomplishments that have happened at this site remain relevant today. GlaxoSmithKline, who acquired Burroughs Welcome in North Carolina, currently hails these efforts on a web page entitled, Taking It Back to Tuckahoe. So you can go and take a look at that. And it says, our commitment to innovative research goes back 90 years in Tuckahoe, 
where some of GlaxoSmithKline's greatest scientific and medical breakthroughs had their origins at Burroughs Wellcome's research laboratories. Turning the traditional product-oriented research methods of the pharmaceutical industry on their head, researchers at our Burroughs Wellcome lab in Takahoe used cross-discipline approaches to drug development methodology, and several of the most celebrated research scientists in GlaxoSmithKline's history, including Nobel laureates George Hitchings, and Gertrude Elion, who is on the poster here, called Tuckahoe home. The drug discoveries they made there include some of the first to treat leukemia, gout, viral infections, and organ transplant rejection, as well as AZT to treat HIV. We continue to honor the spirit of the Tuckahoe Experimental Laboratories in our contemporary research operations through the U.S. In closing, Rather than a meaningless tower of bricks, the smokestack remains a towering icon of industrial and medical history and achievement, which is why the original stipulation should be adhered to and honored. The preservation of this historic mill as part, this is a quote from Pillar of Yonkers, the preservation of this historic mill as part of a larger group of buildings presents a shining example of intelligent planning for the future. It is hoped that the Yonkersonians possess sufficient sentiment to pause long enough in the feverish rush towards streamlining to preserve the distinguished buildings remaining in their midst. They represent an important chapter of a great past and rightfully belong to future generations destined to appreciate them. And this was written in 1951. And I also wanted to add um, that I know that when we're talking about preserving the, the landmark, um, that there are historic preservation grants that can be applied for to, um, to get funds to preserve uh, these types of icons. And I don't know if, if that had um, been pursued. Uh, in addition, um, I have a petition here. And I'm also speaking on behalf of Claire Gorman from 24 Bronx Street, who could not be here tonight. Um, I'm going to give these to you, but I wanted to read the, the attached, are the signatures of over 185 people who want to see the smokestack on the Riverview property maintained. The preservation of this historical land, Tuckahoe landmark was included in the Tuckahoe Planning Board's 1999 resolution when the property was converted to apartment. There was only one reason to include a condition in the resolution, resolution for the owners of the Riverview property to maintain the smokestack, and that is its historical significance. If anything, 20 years later, it is even more historically significant. Included in this petition are the signatures of Tuckahoe's four former living mayors, Phil White, Michael Martino, John Fitzpatrick, and Steve Eklund. There are also several former village trustees, planning and zoning board members, East Chester and Tuckahoe Historical Committee members, and many residents. Please respect and support the work and efforts of the 1999 Planning Board and uphold the resolution and their condition to maintain the smokestack. By the way, many of us who see the smokestack from our homes and property so much appreciate and even love seeing it every day. It is part of our history and part of our daily lives. And we ask that the petition be placed in the record and that the public hearing be kept open. and then give the rest to Elaine. Give it to uh, Nancy. Hi. Hi there. Um, my name's Ann Mazzo. I'm a condo owner at the Riverview. 
I'm just very moved to speak. I'm kind of speaking off the cuff. I hope you'll forgive That's me fine. if I'm oh. not as organized as our previous two presenters. Uh, but I do want to say, in response to our previous two presenters, who, who gave us a lot of compelling information uh, about the heritage of this town, and we are proud to live here in part because of its amazing heritage. They've brought a petition, apparently with 185 signatures. That's great. Where are those people tonight? We're here. The condo residents are here. We're living here now every day with this <laughs> dangerous edifice. It's dangerous in the way that my neighbor really articulated really well, so I won't go over that again. Uh, but it's also dangerous in a way um, that you probably know because I know you visited, uh, but is scary and the way that it, it ruins sight lines when you're driving. There's going to be an accident. I have I won't be, wouldn't be at all surprised if there has been, not just for the residents of the Riverview, but for the many people who live, work, and visit uh, the fountains right behind us. You can't see as you come around. Also, the people who use the restaurant who think they're getting out the other way and then they have to spin around, you can't see. And it's frightening, aside from the structural issues. But I also want to address something that's awkward to talk about, but very real for those of us who live in the building. And uh, Mr. Leo, I wrote you a letter. I, you may remember that I mentioned this. But you know, those condos are a huge investment for us. And we invested in them because we want to be there. We want to be in the town. We're really proud of it. Many of you, if I had my dog here, would probably recognize me from running all over every morning, every street and park in this area. Um, it's, it's a huge investment that we've made, and we want to take care of it. And a big part of that is the way that we pay into the maintenance so that we have the, the things Benchmark is taking care of right now, improving the roof, uh, all of these things that you know what goes into maintaining a building. But it's really key. Um, and then to see that drained for something that is structurally unsound. I understand that it is connected uh, to a historic site and that many important and amazing innovations happened in this area. Um, but, and you know, you've been there. We're not talking about something that's on the corner. It's in the back in our private property. And I, I know people can see it from their homes which is safer, <laughs> frankly, than those of us who have to see it because we live there. Uh, but lastly, I want to say, you know, we will pay for this. I mean, we have to pay to remove it, so we're already going to pay for it. Um, but if we, the costs, the estimates which were presented to you are staggering, and we will bear that as the owners. If we can, if we decide to stay the course, which is a real question. Um, the, definitely the way that we will pay for it is go by, you know, spending money. And I just want to go down some of the places that are open in Takaho now where we spend our money regularly, like the Tap House, Growlers, Nutmeg, Burrito Poblano, Martins, the Broken Bro Brewery, Consignments on the Square. I train with Juan, Yoga Haven, Sedora Spa, Industry 80, the place where my husband gets his haircut that I can't remember the name of, the Kennedy Canine Center, uh, Takahoe Animal Hospital, a number of our other doctors are in the area too. But and that's, I, I think that's, a, it's awkward to talk about money, especially in a public forum, but I, I, I can't let it go. We just, I have to say it and um, so thank you. Okay. Hi. Hi, good evening. Uh, my name's Tina Brown. I live um, at the condominium. I am actually currently the uh, board president, and I have been, um, <clears throat> excuse me, for uh, about three and a half years. Uh, when I came on the board, our main focus was really looking at everything and trying to address all issues. 
And from that time, it, the smokestack was one of them, just because it was blatant that it was unsafe. Um, and we, e even based upon, the, I think, the same report that's been referenced um, from 2014 was the last report that, that we had. And even from that time, we were very concerned about the cost of addressing the issues in a way that would need uh, for them to be addressed in order to have a safe structure. So uh, we began a process in reevaluating the building, the facade, a lot of um, major projects to make sure that uh, the building is kept the way that it should be. Um, and uh, we got a new management company and we've really worked in earnest to try to um, just address all these sorts of issues. Uh, as you know, we've done extensive work on the building facade, and we're going to be doing more work. That's our plan, and we've done roof work, and we take a lot of pride in our building. And part of that is because of its historic um, nature. And I think that that's uh, one point that may have been lost here: that the building, that the two buildings that we're maintaining, do have hi historic significance, and that we are putting a lot of resources um, to keep them. Uh, so that they can be maintained and enjoyed by all residents for years. And I think what my neighbor was just expressing is a real concern for our finances uh, if we have to do what needs to be done based upon these estimates to get the smokestack, if it's even possible. I mean, I've heard that we may have to take it down and rebuild it and that based upon the infrastructure that it really may not be possible to save it and that if we are forced as a condominium to bear that cost, that it could really jeopardize our ability to be a functioning condominium, which I would argue is not good for anybody in the town um, because we are contributing to the town and maintaining a, you know, a historic site. And uh, I just think that that is important to, to note. Um, I won't go into the safety issues because that's been well covered. Um, but I think what you see here is a condominium that, and, and neighbors that enjoy and have chosen to live in Tuckahoe for a reason. I myself grew up in East Chester and Bronxville and I left for a number of years and have come back because of the great connection I have um, to this area. And so I think that we all appreciate uh, the town's concerned about history, but I think that we need to look at it um, from our perspective. It needs to be looked at from our perspective as well, and um, just the effect that it will have on our ability to be contributing neighbors that continue to maintain the building the way that it should be to keep that history alive. Thank you very much. Before you leave, just a, just a quick question. Um, since you're the board president, I'm just curious, yes. uh, have, have uh, uh, there been any attempts to actually go out and try to find some sort of funding, uh, hi historical funding we or grants or? Uh, well, right now it is not historically designated. I right. think as it was uh, said by my other neighbor in Tuckahoe, um, it is eligible, but even on that site, it was not officially designated. We have, co we contacted, myself included, a number of companies about the actual bricks to see um, and initially it was just to defray the costs of even if we had to remove or repoint, like was there any way because even any sort of removal or any work that would need to be done, we were concerned about the cost. We looked into companies that may be interested in the bricks or even if they couldn't be that, used. But that's from a recycling perspective. What I'm suggesting and is And I was told, but in that process, I was told that these, um, that these structures are so they just they were so regularly used that they're actually not that they're not valuable to the town but as a, from a I guess outside perspective that it was just no I, I understand that I guess my question is have you tried to get any grants of any sort to, to help defray the costs I I was told I, I personally did not look into any grant right. grants while I was on the board I was told again because it's not considered historical that right. that was not something that was available, and I believe it was researched by prior boards, but again, um, I, I can't speak personally to that. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else like to speak? 
Come on up. What? I think. All right. <laughs> Sal Provenzano, uh, 11 River Street. I am not a condominium owner. And I have to say that um, I am moved by the, the plight that the condominium owners are in. Um, this is a very difficult situation that the condominium owners inherited. Um, it seems to me that in 1999, there was a stipulation that this smokestack landmark was supposed to be maintained. For whatever reason, the uh, condominium owner associations up until this point chose not to do it. And my question is, if it was maintained the way that it should have been since 1999, would we be in this situation where we would be having this argument? And, and, and I have a problem with rewarding bad behavior because, because of the fact that this uh, landmark was neglected by either overtly or covertly, we're in a situation now where things need to be done to get it in a situation where it should have been maintained for the past 20 years. And I mean, my question is, it, it just doesn't seem fair that we're in a situation now where a landmark has to be taken down because the people that were the stewards it's a historic guys. It's a historic landmark <laughs> guys okay guys okay all right I'm trying to be cordial and if our our condominium owners are not going to be that way guys please I, what to I want to have a civil discussion this evening please the chief I know you are. Please keep quiet. Uh, I, I, if you have a, a comment or if you have a rebuttal, please come up to the stand and make it. Please don't shut out, okay? I'd like to keep this as uh, civil as possible. The only other appreciate comment that, that Thank I have you. to make is that the, the engineer that came up, that I guess he gave a, uh, a visual of this, I would, I would venture to say that there should be a real engineering report that's done, not just a visual with a, a camera or a telephoto lens, but I think that things should be looked at in a way that a, a real evaluation can be made and not just, you know, a, uh, a cursory uh, evaluation. So that's my comments. Thank you. Anyone else want, like to speak? Come on. Good evening. Uh, my name is Dick Olstein. I'm a Riverview uh, resident. Uh, first of all, I think we all resent the continued use of the term landmark because it is not a landmark building. It is eligible. That is, there's a big difference between the two. Um, I think we all appreciate the history going back to the rubber plant and the vitamins and the, uh, the medical uh, issues that were performed here, but they were not performed in the smokestack. They were performed in the buildings. The smokestack had little or nothing to do with it, and to keep referring to this as some great monument to the Spanish-American War, the Civil War, I mean, I, I think that's a little ludicrous. Well, by so today's we standard, you call that an accessory structure. I'm sorry? By today's standard, you would call that an accessory structure. To the, uh, to the buildings. So keep going there. Okay. In any oh, event, okay. uh, <laughs> in any event, I think to, to refer to this, uh, with all due respect, we all appreciate the history of Tuckahoe. Know that. But the history is not encompassed in the smokestack. Thank you. Come on up. The gentleman in the back with the soup. My name is George Berkman, and um, I was probably the first uh, closing when they converted to a condominium. I was a member of the first board of directors. I'm a member of the present board of directors. Let me assure you, gentlemen, 
that if this were a designated landmark, we wouldn't be here today. We have spent a lot of dollars, a lot of hours, a lot of due diligence researching this. We could not find anywhere that this is a protected designated landmark. Any attempt by the opponents of demolition to use the word landmark, they are, it's, it's aspirational on their part. Uh, uh, we're uh, concerned citizens of Tuckahoe. Uh, we've checked with the village, we've checked with the county, we've checked all over. It is not a protected landmark, be assured of that. Thank you. Uh, again, if anyone hasn't signed the yellow pad, please do so. <laughs> it should have been on the dais. I, I didn't sign it, but I'll sign it. Well, we know who you are. Okay. Uh, good evening, Commissioner. Thanks very much. Uh, good evening. I wasn't going to speak. Um, Dick Foliano, I thought, spoke beautifully for the Historical Society. Um, I'm the president of the Historical Society. And um, I would beg to differ. I feel very bad for these residents who inherited this problem. Um, I think it was a problem created by maybe their former management company. I don't know. Um, but a couple of things. A landmark, right, by definition, is a feature in, or an object in a town that is easy, easily recognizable from a distance or um, help to establish, you know, where you are. Um, that's the definition of a landmark. I don't think anyone has said it's protected because we know it's not protected. Because if it was protected, right, none of us would be here, right? That's stating the obvious. But it is a landmark. Um, I, I, you know, I don't think it's a beautiful landmark. I don't drive by and go, oh my God, what a beauty. I don't, right? But what gets me is, um, and I served on the planning board, and when you, when you make promises going forward into the future, when you grant approvals with stipulations um, that, you know, we'll let you do this, but you have to do this. And you say, okay, I'll do that if you let me do this, right? It's a promise, and it's a promise made in good faith. And when you think 20 years goes by and no one will remember, um, and then you just sort of, you know, hope no one remembers, and you decide to forget about it, well, you're making a terrible precedent, right? And I think that's, that's what's really terrible here. And you have a, you have a difficult decision to make, I and mean, there's no doubt about it. Um, you know, I hope that there's some sort of compromise that can be made. Um, I'm not going to pretend to know the exact condition. If it's very dangerous, obviously that's a bad thing. But for many of the residents who live here, it's a landmark. They grew up with it. You can see it from many a different places throughout the town and the villages. Um, and so I just, I hope something can be done to preserve it. Obviously nobody here wants to see anybody hurt. Um, and, and a lot of us, right? We all live paycheck to paycheck. To paycheck. We're not looking for these people to reach in their pocket every month uh, on an assessment. You know, that's not fair either. But it, it is a landmark and it's part of our history. So, um, you know, I, I don't know what to tell you, but I know you have a difficult decision to make. Um, and I hope that we can maybe come to some sort of compromise to save it going forward. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. Would any, wait, wait to the end. I'll just let, let's get everybody uh, comments. Anyone else? Uh, my name is Julio Petronio. Uh, I live at 7 Railroad Avenue. Um, I'm a third generation Tuckahoe person. Um, I'm going to take you through a little history of the town. This town was a very, very poor town um, at one point. It's not the town you see today. If you lived on Railroad Avenue, you knew at 4 o'clock that you could not leave because Burroughs Welcome was emptying out. There were hard working people that were leaving that. And they were, it, it wasn't the only industry in this town. This town had a lot of industries. There, it was a marble industry. At one point, there was a Lucchese marble where the library is. I don't know if anyone remembers that. A across from there, the Tower Club, there used to be a live poultry market. We have a, a Starbucks uh, in this town. Um, when I grew up, no one bought coffee. When, the, when people went to work at Burroughs Welcome, everyone had a lunch pail ba basket. And they, they bought therm Does anyone have thermoses anymore? Do they exist anymore? Everyone had a thermos that they bought their own coffee with. When you look around this town, you see very, very well-maintained property. We take a lot of pride in our property. It's because we maintain our property. A gentleman here said he did due diligence to find out that this was not a landmark. Apparently, he's on the board. He did not due diligence 
to know that he was supposed to maintain that structure. The amount of money that this has to be fixed probably would not be so large had they made that structure properly. Now, all of us maintain our property. We did not agree to maintain that smokestack. Whoever bought this structure decided to maintain that. When the tap house opened, I went there with my brother, and I ended up uh, getting an artisanal gin, very, very expensive, uh, one of the best gins I've ever had. And I was talking to the people next to me, and someone said they came from New York to come to Tuckahoe to come to the tap house. And my brother and I looked at each other, and the world had turned, because when I grew up, no one wanted to come to Tuckahoe. We all wanted to leave. Now, I understand that this is a lot of money, and, and, and clearly there is a safety structure involved. And we see something like this happen in our, our, in our public life, where things become inconvenient for corporations, so we get rid of the, the consequences of it. If this is truly a structural problem that's dangerous, truly a structural problem that is dangerous, then it should be taken down. I have no doubt about that. If it's something that can be fixed and maintained, that they are obligated contractually to maintain, they should maintain it. They should bite the bullet. I did not agree to maintain that structure. They should have known when they made those agreements to purchase their condos that that was part of the agreement. When I, my name is Julio Petronio. When I, when I sign a contract and when I buy a house, I know what's in there. I know what the easements are. I know what my obligations are. This should not be something that is lightly tossed away. Don't want to use landmark? Fine. Don't call it a landmark. Call it a significant structure. The country is changing. We should not forget where we came from. We should not forget where we're going. We should not forget our obligations. This was an obligation I did not undertake. They undertook it. If that has to go down for, stru for safety reasons, take it down. Otherwise, maintain it. I don't know that if they had maintained it on a proper basis, they wouldn't be looking at $500,000, $600,000. It's an extraordinary amount of money. It's also an obligation. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Wayne Vlacos. I live at 310. Apartment 310 at One Scarsdale Road. I uh, was a former business owner of a corporation on Manhattan, and one day I said I liked. I lived in a uh, condominium. I loved the idea, and I liked the high ceilings. I lived in one in the lofts in New York City ever since I moved there in my early 20s. I'm 67, and I went to a real estate agent where I bought very nice apartments in New York City. I did well. I retired at 60. I'm 67. And I said, well, look at this building in Tuckahoe. And I told my mother, and I said to her, you know, there's a very nice condominium in Tuckahoe. My mother said, Tuckahoe? She said, you don't want to live there. I grew up here. Her name is Elaine Gould. And my father grew up in Bronxville. And he went to Bronxville High, and she went to Tuckahoe. And so I got in the car. I said, well, look around here. Oh, that's the school. And she's talking about all the people she went to school with. Then she told me what it was like here. First of all, she was alive during the Depression. She said they were selling cocaine. The place, she said, was infested by mafia. And you couldn't even go to the local theater because it was so full of bugs that mothers wouldn't let their kids there. She said that most of the people were unemployed and you could get whatever drug you wanted. And then she said it was Italian, as you cannot believe, and it was full of, and she mentioned all the gangsters that lived here. And she said, what in the hell do you want to live here for? I said, well, I've always lived in lofts. I love high ceilings, I have 10, 11 foot ceilings. He said, well, look at that place. It has a smokestack. She went in to said, you know how miserable people were here and how poor, poor they were? She was very lucky. And my father was this kind of little fancy guy with his custom-made golf clubs. And he hung out with the Kennedys over in Bronxville. And he was a well-to-do guy. Anyway, so she said, OK. So I'm, she, my father went to war, came back, and they bought a house in South Salem, New York. My entire life, I'd never bothered to come here. 
I like the convenience. It's 35 minutes away from Manhattan, and I still have business to do. There are two things I notice about the smokestack. A, it's ridiculous, and you think it's nice. The buildings where in private individuals have fixed them up inside, which I did. I put a lot of oak in. That's nice. The smokestack, I always said, well, that's got to go. And also you see, which I'll go into, it's a very nice restaurant there. Half of it is too modern for me, but I like it. And people know it, and I've eaten there a number of times. It's very convenient, and the food is good. It has charm, okay? There's a quality to it. The river's there, and it's the old mill. Everyone knows it. First light on the Bronx or Parkway. There's this nice restaurant. Everyone, people in Manhattan know it. Of course, everybody always says, well, but everybody likes to go eat in Bronxville. Well, my grandmother lived in Bronxville for her entire life, and she passed away about 15 years ago, maybe a little bit more. So I, said, so I looked at this and I said, look at the maintenance. She said, yeah, but, and I said, okay, well, I'll try it. Little did I know at the time that there were two things going on, and this is what, to use the phrase, maybe I know it's not inappropriate, for the smoke cycle, it's, be, it's become a tremendous liability. Uh, the maintenance in this building is very high, and I pay taxes on it, and it's convenient to New York, and I didn't think it was that expensive to buy it, but then again, I was used to Manhattan prices. There are two things I've noticed about it. It seems that everyone seems to think, well, the building and the co-op and the owners were remiss. And then I happened to mention, as you were mayor and other people here said, what about all the other mayors since 2013? What, ac what action did this town, the village, excuse me, village of Tuckahoe, ever take to go after the building and get down and say, hey, what about the smoke tax, smoke stack? We think it's important. I have yet to see anyone ever mention that you, who are the elected officials here, ever had the slightest interest in it, ever pursued this contract. My opinion is that I would not have bought this apartment if I had any idea that I had to pay for this thing. To knock it down is one thing. I've wanted it knocked down. I bought there four years ago. Hey, look, it's you drive around the thing, and it, you know it's got old people here. And, as I said, the thing can fly apart. They all just fall apart. It's inevitable. But it's almost as if it's as all the crime is on the owners of the, the co-op who we bought in good faith ourselves, that we were not buying into a fraud committed by the sponsor when we bought the bill. But no one mentioned to me ever, and I've lived there for four years, that there was a liability in some clause signed in 1999 or 98 for the maintenance of this, and no one, and what, I would like some information, if you have any, on what previous mayors and board ever took the slightest interest in it and ever pursued it as an object that they want maintained, landmark or not, because it seems like we're the only ones who are all wrong, yet there's two sides in this agreement. There's a side that says, this is what you signed and this is what you didn't do, but what did you not do? since two, 1999 to pursue the maintenance. Did you ever fine anybody in the last 10 years and say, why didn't you do the pointing on the brick? Why didn't you do this? I don't see any activity here. And when I purchased it, there is, it may sound ridiculous to you or my legal uh, problem, not yours. Absolutely no one said to me anything other than, and I've been after it before, is why don't we just take this down they always fall down, and they are a liability. And the thing goes crashing into the building, and there's old people living next door. How do you think the town's going to look then? I mean, don't you think you'll be on the front page of the New York Times? People die in Tuckahoe. Uh, m lack of maintenance. The town never paid any attention to a, what is it, 90-foot smokestack for 20 years. But suddenly, the tenants and the owners who are investing in and paying taxes in this town we're all wrong, but you never did anything at your end. I don't mean you personally, because you haven't, probably haven't been here for 20 years. But you're placing, there's almost a crime of omission on both sides here. The fraud committed when, he, when I purchased in, but also the lack of this village to ever pursue that this thing should be maintenance. All of a sudden it's important, but never did you ever fine, penalize, to do any studies on your own until we did to see that nobody's maintained it for 20 years. Now, as a tenant, I'm going to be penalized because I bought in four years ago. 
and I'm an idiot for buying it. There are 40 people there, and I just got a bill from East Chester and taxes all the time and the school thing. How can I, how am I supposed to act like I'm the bad guy when if you wanted to maintain, well, we ha you've had 20 years to go after the previous owners and say maintain it. I wouldn't have this problem if you, the t village, had been up on this all along instead of walking in today and saying, well, there's something wrong. It's obviously an old smokestack, and it's been an old smokestack. But my mother was here, and she knew the people that worked here in the town and all the rest of it. Anyway, I said my little bit, I'll let you go. Just for the record, this is the planning board. It's not the, the, the board of trustees. Okay, thank you. My name is Brian Dunn. I, I also live in Riverview. We've owned the apartment for about 10 years now. I'm sorry. Um, my name is Brian Dunn. I've lived at Riverview for, uh, we've owned for about 10 years there. Um, I'm sort of a pragmatist. I've listened to all this stuff today, and, and I acknowledge that there's a real history behind Tuckahoe and the, and the buildings, and certainly maintaining the buildings where the work happened, and uh, the stone mill is you know, not across the river and actually in Yonkers and not our responsibility, so I don't know how it got get sort of grouped back in with the, with the building. But the fact that when you said you went and you actually lifted a brick out, that's pretty terrifying to me. Mm -hmm. Who walks by there? One brick, by the way. Just well, but you, if you can pull one, you could probably pull a hundred, right? I don't know about you know? that. I don't know about and that. <laughs> <laughs> Did you put it back? Of course. <laughs> um, I mean, that's pretty terrifying. And the fact that it's going to cost you know, half a million dollars to fix it, if we even could fix it, I think is a pretty compelling piece of information. And so what we had to look at is we are where we are today, right? And mm -hmm. the, um, you know, the sponsor that originally made that arrangement reneged on a lot of things that we're also dealing with today. That's uh, what I hear. Today. So um, I, I assume we've inherited that responsibility, but I think you a little compassion on that front would be, would be helpful for all the owners because like Tina said, you know, we only have so much money to spend and if we want to maintain something, we probably want to maintain the building that you're so, you're so enamored with um, as opposed to a st smokestack that's probably going to fall down and hurt somebody. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone else want to speak? Like to Hold on. Just don't know. Just go one more person. So we'll make you the last if, for this evening, if that's okay. My name is Andrew Manuelli. I'm a retired Army Colonel. I'm a resident of one Scarsdale Road, one of the condo owners there. And I want to back up what one of my neighbors said. There are 88 units in that building, all occupied by taxpayers. Taxpayers. I don't know what that smokestack pays in taxes, but I know what we pay. Now, it was said that by the recent speaker, if I had known that we were going to have to foot the bill for maintaining that monstrosity, I probably would have never bought that place. And I think there's a lot of people in that building feel the same way that I did. Now, you can call me a sucker for buying a place when I had no idea that I was supposed to maintain that smokestack. It was my fault. I should have gotten a lawyer to dig into the very tiny details to find out exactly what I was supposed to be liable for when I bought that place. Because I'm going to be frank. If I knew that for per perpetuity we would have to maintain that thing, and I understand what the gentleman was saying about if we maintained it, the bill wouldn't be that long. How long are we supposed to pay that bill? Okay, to make you feel happy looking at a smokestack, we have to pay. It's a smokestack. If you want to commemorate the history of Tuckahoe, erect a plaque. Again, I'm angry about this whole situation because as a retired colonel, and by the way, I'm also an engineer, and I would condemn that damn smokestack in a heartbeat. And if you want to know what my background is, you can go out to oil fields, pipelines, roads in Africa, because I built them. That thing is an eyesore. It is a danger. I don't know about bricks flying out of it, but nearly three times I've been close to being rammed by cars driving up that street because you've got to inch your way out. You can't see past the damn thing. 
It's the smokestack. The beauty of the building is the building itself. That is not a, it's not the Lincoln Monument. It's not Grant's tomb. I, I, I apologize for not having my, my, my points all lined out in bullet form with a nice slide or whatever. It's just that as an Italian, and by the way, as a kid who worked with my grandfather's building firm putting up the post office and putting up the little shopping plaza across the street with it, I know Tuckahoe, I grew up in this area, and all of us, my entire family, and we're all builders. The Manueli family is known in the past for having been responsible for a lot of the structures that exist right now. Tucko, East Chester, Bronxville, and Yonkers. And as far as the Yonkers Historical Society goes, Yonkers is a dump. I don't really care what they say about what's historic and what's not. I didn't move to Yonkers. I moved to Tuckahoe. There's a history in this town. There's a history in every building. Does that mean we never take them down? when they become useless, they no longer serve a purpose. Again, I apologize to everybody here for rambling on and on. It's just that I think everybody needs to understand that the residents at that building, we feel that we were ripped off. And when we tried to do the right thing by getting rid of that structure, now all of a sudden the issue came up, oh, you people haven't been maintaining it. Well, God darn, whoever said we were supposed to? Oh, it was in the agreement from 1999. I've only been there for 40 years. So again, understand that we like living in Tuckahoe. We want to continue living in Tuckahoe and paying our taxes in Tuckahoe. And believe me, we pay a lot, as I'm sure you realize. And for us to be saddled with a bill because somebody believes that the smokestack has some kind of inherent value which it really doesn't have is, I'm sorry, it's unacceptable. You'll be the last. Ms. Provenzano, you'll be the last. You have some, you want to come up? No, Provenzano. Did you want to say something, Ms. Provenzano? Yes, I Okay. I would just, um, I think by, you know, we started out with the um, expense of it, and now, you know, I think what's really evident is you just don't want it, you don't value it, um, and you also don't understand the the composite of that complex, and, and you know, you're looking at everything separately. Ms. Provenzano, just direct yes. everything to me, please, don't, don't, yes. go, go. Um, anyway, and, and, and so please, please, guys, please. <laughs> Yonkers, uh, this this complex, there was no Yonkers in Tuckahoe. It was all one. Um, and I know that, that you have paid money already to decide that this is what you want to do. Um, but if we just allow anything to just go, then our history will be erased. We can't just allow, if there were stipulations made, we can't just allow anybody to change that because then where do we stand as a village? Okay. So. Thank you, Ms. Ramazan. Okay, so at this point, uh, just want to, sure. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for hearing us tonight, uh, for listening to the public input. Uh, just, and I understand this is going to be adjourned. Uh, I spoke to Mr. Mr. Gertzen, and I understand you won't be making a decision tonight. No. She'll be getting some input from your planning consultant, uh, who I, I've worked with their firm. They're a fine, fine mm -hmm. planning firm. Uh, Two points from a legal perspective, I think it is very important that the word landmark, capital L, not be used to refer to this structure because it has a very specific legal meaning. I understand there's a dictionary meaning, but lawyers don't talk like normal people. That's for sure. We use terms of art that mean something legally. So maybe it fits the dictionary definition, perhaps, arguably of landmark, but from a legal perspective, it is only eligible for listing on the National Register as part of an overall complex, which by the way, used to have, from what I've heard anecdotally, nine, 10, or 11 smokestacks total, all of which were removed except for this one. And I think a great point was made about the condo building itself preserving the history. And that 
really being the focal point. Um, and again, I'll go back to where I started. We're not here to debate what was in the original planning board approval before this was even a condominium 20 years ago. We're here to talk about the facts on the ground. And there was another reference, I believe, to getting a real engineering inspection. Well, Mr. Walsh is a licensed professional engineer with expertise in inspecting and evaluating brick structures. And just want to read for the public his conclusion. The structural damage that has occurred to the smokestack at Riverview Condominiums is irreversible. The chimney brick structure as is is deteriorated and not structurally sound. That is a licensed professional engineer with expertise in this area saying that, stamping it, putting his professional license on the line by signing that report. So I think that has a lot of probative value as the board weighs what it, as the chairman said at the work session, is a very difficult decision. Um, and I'm sure you'll weigh all the evidence you've heard as well as the input you get from your professional staff. So we thank you and uh, we hope at your next meeting you'll be in a position to close the public hearing and grant approval for this important application for the folks that are Tuckahoe residents that live in this building and balance it against what else you heard uh, and make a decision to approve the application. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so at this point, I'd like to make a motion to maintain, keep open the public hearing. Can I have a second, please? Second. second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, so we're going to keep this open until um, uh, next month. We're going to get our consultants to give us uh, some feedback. Uh, and we'll let everybody know. Uh, I'd like to thank you, everybody, for being civil this evening, and, uh, and hopefully we can keep this uh, uh, going forward until we make a decision, all right? Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Thank Have you. a good evening, guys. Sorry? Okay. Okay, uh, welcome back. Uh, we had to clear out the room, and we have to set for our next uh, uh, applicant. So at this point, uh, I'd like to bring up 82 Wallace. It's a construction of a new apartment building. Thank you for your patience, guys. You're welcome, Mr. Chairman. And good evening, everyone. My name is Stephen Accionelli from Veneruso, Curto, Schwartz and Curto. Here on 82 Wallace on behalf of the applicant. Since we've been here before, I won't go into too much detail about the prior history with the board's permission, given that most of that's in the record already. Uh, if you don't mind, if okay. pe for people watching home tonight, okay, just, can sure. you just give us the uh, abridged version so that, uh, um, you know, rather than people going back and looking at multiple uh, videos. So this property is 82 Wallace. It's located um, on the corners of Lime Kiln Road, Wallace Street, and, and Maynard Street. And the main entrance to the proposed structure is going to be on Maynard Street. Um, the the um, site uh, formerly housed a number of vacant improvements, um, which were cleared to make way for the new the new structure. The new structure um, is going to be a three-story um, apartment building with um, two studio apartments, seven one-bedroom apartments, twenty two-bedroom apartments, and three three-bedroom apartments. The building will also offer green and buffered community amenity spaces for the use and enjoyment of the residents. Since the last planning board meeting, the applicant attended a number of planning board work sessions and communicated with village representatives regarding site plan and related matters. As a result of those, those work sessions and communications, additional information and details were submitted as requested and discussed and numerous functional and design elements were added and or revised with respect to the project. As a result, the planning board now has before it a comprehensive site plan that is a result of a truly collaborative effort between the applicant and the village representatives, especially the planning board and the building department. As the board will also recall, this application was originally presented at the August 2018 workshop and thereafter adjourned while the matter proceeded through the zoning board and further changes were made in response to the zoning board, which issued its approval on February 13th, 2019. Here with me tonight is Nima Badali from Badali Architects. He will discuss the site plan and walk the planning board and the public through the design elements of the proposed project. Thank you. Thank you. 
Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Um, uh, as uh, was discussed, this uh, proposal is a three-story residential building with two floors of uh, parking underneath. Uh, as uh, you recall, on the last work session, there was some comments uh, regarding the lighting plan as well as the uh, retaining wall and uh, in front of the building. Uh, I just want to approach the drawings and uh, show you what the uh, changes was made. Sure. Take the microphone with you. Of course. So, uh, we, I in the elevation drawing, uh, we located all the light fixtures uh, uh, and we also added additional light fixtures in the back of the property, which uh, are located uh, on the elevation, I also also revised the lighting plan to show the um, you know where all the lights are located and how the photometric uh, affect the property. Are, are those being added on each level at the terrace yes, levels? That's correct. We added on all the levels. Okay, good. Not just there. What did, what did you do on the roof? Uh, where we have the uh, open area space. What did you do there? We have, we have light fixtures. Again, let me show you on the elevation. Uh, we have down lights uh, uh, li uh, that, that uh, shoot the light uh, down into the recreation area. Uh, we also uh, included this uh, uh, railing as it was. So before we leave the roof lighting, uh, I mean, so you have a, a terrace, which is a communal, ter communal terrace on the uh, uh, upper level. Uh, so if I want to have, or uh, so someone, some tenant wants to have, let's say, a barbecue out there at 10 o'clock at night or 9 o'clock at night, uh, is there any, uh, any additional lighting that's, uh, any sort of ambient lighting that's being provided so that? Absolutely, there is. There is because down lighting, you know, off of a building only provides these kind of scalp lighting. It doesn't really provide oh, you kind of a... These, as you can see, you know, they, they provide uh, quite adequate light for the, there is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen feet. There is approximately one light fixture every ten feet or so. And is, what is it, that light fixture at the bottom? Uh, yes, this would be these light fixtures. Yeah, that doesn't give up a great deal of light. Uh, that fixture typically does not give up a, light, a great deal. It's a more of a scallop light fixture. It's scallop down, scallop up, and it's not really... Is meant to be. I can change that, those lights with something. Yeah. Is that no, a, maybe is that something. A is that a wall sconce? Yeah, it's basically a wall sconce, yeah. right? Yeah, I can change those with some light fixtures that provide. Uh, or perhaps you could extend some in, inside the uh, area, or, you know, sure. some decorative landscape lighting or something like that. Sure. Just again to provide uh, um, yeah. if someone's out there late in the evening, you know, they can hang out and have of some. Yeah, actually, uh, we can we can do something. You know, on on these uh, on these walls, sh shooting this way. Right. Uh, we're at low level. Uh, exactly. Low level. Sure. Uh, right. Now, if you allow me to go to the railing in front of the property, as we as it was discussed uh, and recommended by uh, the board members, we took the same railing design of the balconies and uh, extended that throughout uh, the front of the property retaining wall with piers uh, approximately every uh, uh, nine and a half to 10 feet apart that we appear. The piers are about 18 by 18, and uh, there will be the same um, um, brick as the uh, building is. I have the samples in a minute I will show you. Uh, with the same uh, uh, cast stone coping that uh, is utilized throughout the building. Um, I would like to show the samples of brick. Thank you. We have the general uh, uh, 
brickwork of the building, which is this red brick. Uh, the, I'm going to show you on the drawing some, there are some areas uh, that, are, that have an accent brick, which is uh, uh, this a little bit darker brick. And this sample is the cast stone that uh, we are recommending to go with these two. Um, I, okay. will, it, will the cast stone also be on the cornices as well? That is correct. I. <coughs> the contrasting brick is utilized mostly on the accent areas. You need an assistant. <laughs> hey, give that back. So one of the changes that uh, with cooperation with the board members was done was uh, these uh, stair towers uh, were pulled out uh, and raised uh, to make a bigger statement. Uh, and those areas are uh, provided with the accent brick. Also, uh, the entryway, at the entryway, we are also providing the accent brick to make the entrance a little bit more uh, substantial. Um, at this point, if there is any question uh, that I can, can answer. You over, can you go over the landscaping, please? Upper floor? Uh, you can uh, landscape of the ground floor and then also the the terraces that uh, the landscape terraces that you're providing in this development. Let me start with the uh, landscape terrace. Um, basically, on the on the terrace we have uh, three different areas uh, of the recreation terrace. One area is, is this area, which is mostly for barbecuing and entertainment uh, by the uh, tenants. The other area is more relaxing if you want to get a suntan or just lay down. And in the middle, we're providing uh, an area where the tenants can have uh, uh, a communal garden. And that can be used by all tenants, correct? That is correct, yes. This, this area is for the use of the tenants. So by all those green plots there, you're going you know, to allocate a green plot to whoever wants one? Is that how it works? Uh, Just curious. Uh, take your microphone afterwards, all right? Don't forget. Seems like I have all the uh, no, all no, the drawings. You don't have all the drawings, apparently. Yeah, it looks like I, I am missing the, the most important drawing. Yeah, exactly. The, uh, landscaping plan. Yeah. I, have, I have all the drawings for the uh, engineering. I don't see the landscaping plan. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. a rental fee. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, 
So basically, basically, on on this landscaping plan. Use the big clip on top. The big clip's on the board itself. Yeah. I'll use yours. Or. Sorry. No Basically, we have several areas uh, in this uh, site plan. Uh, uh, on Limekin, we have uh, a driveway that goes to the lowest uh, story of the parking lot. Uh, after that, the whole front is basically the building is set back about 10 feet or so, and that is the landscaped area with trees and some bushes. Uh, on Wallace uh, Street side, we have created another recreation area for use of tenants, uh, uh, which has a pathway with some chairs and uh, additional bushes and trees. Um, on Maynard, uh, first, uh, since the, this, the street slopes up uh, uh, at the lowest portion, we have a driveway to the second story of the um, parking lot. As you come up, we have the entrance to the building and then uh, again, we have tried to create another area for recreation use of the tenants with the gazebo at the end of this area. Uh, the retaining wall that I was showing you before, it extends at this portion of the site. Um, Did you add a little bit of lighting like we discussed? Yes, in the piers? Yes, yes. On, in the piers? Yes, LED lighting inside the piers. Yes. Okay. Do you mind showing the rendering, colored rendering, for the people at home? Of course. Appreciate it. So we have uh, created four different uh, uh, color rendering uh, from uh, different uh, views of the property. Um, that's this would be the lime kiln, right? That's, that's lime kiln. No. This uh, this one would be main. Main, okay. That's uh, main art. This would be looking at it from the corner of Wallace and Main Art, and as I was saying, how the street slopes up. And then as we turn around from Wallace, going into Lime King, uh, looking uh, towards uh, East Chester. And then lastly, here we are looking at the lowest level parking entrance, uh, looking towards Yonkers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nima. Um, with that, Mr. Chairman, we have no further comments. So unless the board has any additional questions, uh, we have nothing further to add. And we would respectfully request a favorable resolution from the board at this time. Does anyone else have any questions, concerns? No. Okay, so at this point, I'd like to read a resolution. Oh, I'm sorry, hold on a second. Uh, so at this point, uh, I think we still have the public uh, meeting open, so I make a motion to reopen the public uh, um, no move. Second. 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 All in favor? Aye. Aye. Since there's no one else here this evening, that doesn't belong to the developer. Uh, at this point, I make a motion to close the public hearing. No move. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So at this point, we'd like to read a resolution. Resolution adopting a negative declaration under the State Environmental Quality Review Act and site plan approval as part of a proposed multifamily building at 82 Wallace Street. 
Whereas the Tuckahoe Village's Department of Buildings received a building permit application received on December 20th, 2018 for a multifamily building at 82 Wallace Street. Whereas the proposed action is the request of a site plan approval as part of a plan to redevelop the existing site as multifamily housing. The proposed building will include 32 units, 48 parking spaces, 45 of which are in an enclosed garage and landscaped areas and screening along the frontage of the property, along Wallace Street, Maynard Street, and Lime Kiln Road. Whereas the Zoning Board of Appeals previously conducted an uncoordinated review of the project as part of the State Environmental Quality Review Act, CECRA, and determined that there will be no significant environmental impacts from this action as it concerns the variances requested for the proposed project. Whereas based on environmental assessment form, EAF, submitted by the applicant and any supplemental materials thereto, the planning board has determined that there will be no significant environmental impacts from this action as it concerns the proposed project. Whereas the approval of the proposed action is classified as an unlisted action under Part 617 of CECRA, and whereas under Tuckahoe Village law, the planning board is the only entity that can grant site plan approval. Now, therefore, be it resolved that based on the information included in the EAF submitted by the applicant and any supplemental materials thereto and the criteria contained in the State Environmental Quality Review Act and its implementing regulations, the planning board hereby adopts the attached negative declaration for this unlisted action under the State Environmental Quality Review Act. This resolution shall take effect immediately. Need to vote on that? Uh, second? Second. 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 Uh, Nancy, please call the roll. Commissioner Nirenberg. Four. 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 So at this point, we'd also like to read a uh, planning board resolution. Mm -hmm. Okay. Dave. Planning Board Resolution. This applicant is the record owner of the premises commonly known as eight. Oh, okay. Sorry. Or a start. This is for uh, Planning Board Village of Tucko in the matter of the applicant of Orange World LLC, premises 82 Wallace Avenue, Tuckaho, New York, is the applicant. The Planning Board Resolution follows. The applicant is the record owner of the premises commonly known as 82 Wallace Avenue, Tuckahoe, New York, and known on the tax map of the Village of Tuckahoe, Section 34, Block 4, Lots 1, 2, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10, the premises. The applicant has received the necessary variances from the Village of Tuckahoe Zoning Board and has provided all documents, plans, and materials to this board so as this board can make a proper review under Section 7-1 of the Zoning Code. The plans and submissions of the applicant were provided to the Village Planning, Noah Levine of BFJ Planning, the Village Planning Consultant, Anthony Oliveri of Dolphin Rotfield Engineering, PC, the Chief of the Fire Department, the Chief of the Tuckahoe Police, John Costanzo, and the Head of the Department of Public Works, Frank DeMarco. All the consultants named as well as the named department heads have reviewed the plans and any comments submitted have been addressed by the applicant to the satisfaction of the parties listed with the exception of Anthony Oliveri. Mr. Oliveri's concerns will be conditioned below. Currently existing on the premises are a number of dilapidated structures that have been an eyesore to the surrounding community for, some, for quite some time. The applicant proposes to remove the structures and construct a 32-unit apartment building. After numerous work sessions and public hearings with this board, the applicant has achieved a first-class proposal that will greatly enhance the premises and the surrounding area. Site plan approval for this project is classified as an unlisted action part of under Part 617 of the State Environmental Quality Review Act, CECRA, based on the environmental assessment form EAF submitted by the applicant and the substantial materials thereto. The planning board has determined that there will be no significant adverse environmental impacts from this action as it concerns the proposed project. 
The zoning board also previously conducted an independent, uncoordinated review of the project under CEQA and determined that there will be no significant adverse environmental impacts for the variances requested. Pursuant to the Village of Tuckahoe Zoning Code, the board must review site plans pursuant to 7-1 of the said code. The sections and conclusions are as follows. A, safe, adequate, and convenient vehicular and pedestrian traffic circulation, both within and without the site. The if, number one, the effect of the proposed development on traffic conditions on existing streets. The Village of Tuckahoe Planners BFJ planning have reviewed the project in conjunction with the effect of the project on local traffic. We agree with our planner that there will be no appreciable increase in congestion in the traffic volume and the profile will be very similar to the current traffic conditions. Number two, the number of locations, dimensions, and construction details of vehicular and pedestrian entrances, exits, drives, and walkways. Vehicular access to state, county, or village roads must also be approved by the State Department of Transportation, the County Department of Public Works, or the Village Pub Police Department, and the P Department of Public Works as appropriate. The project has been reviewed by the Chief of Police and the Village of Planners, and both have no issues with the plans provided. We agree that the proposed vehicular and pedestrian movement will flow effortlessly based on the walkways and entrances and exits to the building. The visibility of both directions at all exit points of the site. The driver of an automobile exiting the site should have an obstructed, unobstructed view of the street for that distance necessary to allow safe entrance into the traffic stream. As the entrances and exits are in the middle of the roadway and not located on a corner of the streets, that the entrances and the exits are located are not main thoroughfares, there is no issue for vehicles entering and exiting the premises. Number four, the location arrangement and adequacy of all street parking lots, which shall at a minimum meet the requirements of this zoning ordinance. The applicant proposed sufficient parking so as not to require a variance, thus there is, should be no need for off-street parking for this project. Number five, interconnection of parking lots via access drives within and between adjacent lots in order to provide maximum efficiency, ma minimum curb cuts, and encourage safe and convenient traffic circulation. The parking provided is all on site, thus this condition is satisfied. Number six, the location arrangement and adequacy of loading areas, which shall at minimum meet the requirement of this zoning ordinance. This project is residential, thus there is no need for loading areas. Number seven, patterns of vehicular and pedestrian circulation, both within the boundaries of the development and in the relation to the adjoining street and sidewalk system. The layout of the proposed off street parking has been extensively reviewed by BFJ planning and has been determined by BFJ planning that the proposed layout is conducive to proper circulation of traffic flow and we agree. Number eight, the location arrangement and adequacy of facilities for the physically handicapped such as ramps, depressed curbs, and reserved parking spaces. As a condition of this approval and for the applicant to be compliant with the law, the applicant must meet the every requirement for the ADA. The review of the proposed plan by the building inspector and planners have confirmed that the, plannings, the plans are compliant. Number nine, the location arrangement and adequacy of landscaping with and bordering parking lots and loading spaces, which shall at a minimum meet the requirements of this zoning ordinance. The landscape plans have been submitted and reviewed by the board and the village planners. We are satisfied the applicant has proposed a landscape plan that will greatly enhance the look of the building and be visual, a visual asset to the surrounding community. Number 10, adequacy of fire lanes and other emergency zones. The proposed plans have been reviewed and are acceptable to the fire chief and the chief of police. B. 
the protection of the environmental quality and the preservation and enhancement of property values in the neighboring area. The proposed site is currently occupied by several dilapidated buildings. By taking away this eyesore and replacing it with a first class building, the property values will be preserved and enhanced by this improvement. C. The quality of building and overall site design, which will enhance the project, the character, and the property values of the adjacent neighborhood. The planning board shall evaluate the architectural features of the proposed design to determine if they are in harmony with the neighborhood, including consideration of architectural style, bulk, dimensions, materials, and the location of the site, and in relation to development of adjoining properties the natural terrain and vegetation. The proposed building will continue to the aesthetics and be consistent with the majority of the current buildings located in this residential neighborhood. We are satisfied with the look of the proposed building and how the proposed architecture of the building will enhance the look and the feel of the surrounding area. The applicant has presented to the board the materials and colors of the exterior of the proposed building this board is satisfied with the materials and colors to be used. Therefore, based on the foregoing, the application of the site plan is approved for the following conditions. Condition one, applicant shall maintain the landscaping and pr promptly replace any dead trees or shrubbery with a, li with a like kind replacement. Condition two, applicant shall maintain the terrace area as initially proposed. Condition three, there are still a number of issues outstanding as to the stormwater and sanitary systems. Anthony Oliveri's memo addressed to Bill Williams and dated September 12, 2019, details the outstanding issues. Mr. Oliveri's memo shall be attached to this approval and made part of the same. As a condition to the approval, all issues contained in said September 12, 2019, must be addressed to the satisfaction of Mr. Williams and Mr. Oliveri. The applicant shall continue to the escrow it has with the village so as to compensate the various professionals until this condition is satisfied. If by satisfying the condition in said letter there is a substantial change to the site plan a determined, as determined by the chair of the board, this board, then the applicant must come back before this board to have the changes approved. Lastly, that every representation made to this board by the applicant is a condition of this approval. I'd like to add the, uh, the lighting we just talked about. So can we make that condition number four? So that will be an amended amendment to uh, Member Barra's motion. Yes. We need to vote on that? You don't need to vote on that. Okay. No. So that's lighting approval based on today's discussion. Yes. Okay. 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 Um, can I have a second? Second. Second. Okay. So, Nancy, please uh, call roll. Four. 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 In favor. Uh, I'm sorry, guys. One, one further um, comment, just for just for clarity's sake. I think there may have been some referrals. Wallace Street, Wallace Avenue. I think the correct um, reference is Wallace Street. Just for the record. Um, also, one other thing. My my client um, informed me a little while ago that that he would very much like to make a donation to the village specifically Circuit Park in the amount of $12,000. So I wanted to bring that to the board's attention this evening. Thank you very much. Really appreciate thank that. You. Thank you. And uh, before you guys leave, I, I really want to thank you guys. Uh, I know it's been a process, and you guys have been responsive uh, throughout the entire uh, uh, program. Uh, you've listened to us. You've made the changes to the, the structures and, uh, and the colors, and you've taken our input and really uh, – done a very nice job and uh, I think as uh, we speak for, I speak for the board and I really like uh, uh, to wish you guys uh, great success and hope this project is a, uh, a su successful project for you guys so good luck and uh, get building great thank you all right guys have a great evening thank you very much since there's no further business I make a motion to close the public hearing second, second.
All in favor? Aye. Aye. Good evening, Tuckahoe.